the mass, the mass, M-A-S-S, -S, the mass. If you are God, will you tell me how you wish to be worshipped or will you leave it up to me? If you are God, will you tell me how you wish to be worshipped or will you leave it up to me? So say you, God. You see, God, if you don't tell me how you wish to be worshipped, I'm going to make it up myself. The last time you left it up to me, you went up a mountain with Charlton Heston, my bad, Moses. Forty days later, I have a golden calf, hence where we get the term stiff-necked people. And as a result of it, we spent 40 years in the desert. So you must have given me a rule book how you wish to be worshipped. Because if you don't, then I'm going to have another golden hat. I will have travel ball, kickball, my ball, your ball, every kid is going pro. Every kid is going pro. My brother in Christ, we got all kind of gods. Man, we got the deer stand. We got the duck blind. We just got, it's time to family. I got to go on vacation. My brother and sister in Christ, it's the mass. You need to understand that he gave us a rule book. And that's exactly what you see in play out today. Do you honestly believe that if you went to a service, a synagogue in his hometown of Capernaum, and you went into the synagogue there. Do you think, I'm going to ask you, do you think they worshiped the same way in Capernaum as they did in Joppa on the coast, Bethany and Jerusalem? Or did they worship differently depending on where they are and depending on the personality of the synagogue rabbi? They all worship the exact same way. You didn't walk into Capernaum and somebody's ramping up the music. You didn't go in Joppa and they're selling lattes. You didn't go in the other one and they got the light show, candle show. Work with me. My brother says, Christ, we come to worship him and adore him, not to be entertained by him. So here we go. This is why we do what we do. This is the mass. Where does the word come from? M-A-S-S. -S. Eta misa est. Eta misa est. Go and proclaim the gospel. Go forth and proclaim the good news. That word Misa, M-I-S-S-A, is where we get the word we now know as Mass. It's a Latin term. At the end of Mass, you hear me. The Mass is ended. Thank you. That's exactly right. Go forth and proclaim the gospel. Your mission is just getting started. You got fed intellectually and spiritually. Now go forth and do the same. Proclaim the gospel. Go therefore and baptize in the nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Everything in the Mass is scriptural. Everything is very Jewish. Remember this. If you do not have an altar, you do not have a sacrifice. If you do not have a sacrifice, you do not have the Eucharist. Again, if you do not have an altar, you cannot have a sacrifice. Because the sacrifice has to take place on the altar. If you do not have a sacrifice, then you do not have the Eucharist. So if you walk into a building and there is no altar, then there can't be a sacrifice, which means the Eucharist cannot be altered. If there is no priest in the line of Melchizedek, all the way back to Kepha, Cephas, Peter, then you do not have an altar, which means you don't have a sacrifice, which means you don't have the Eucharist. My brother and sister in Christ, Everything in the Mass is for a reason. Case in point. My brother and sister in Christ, as I drop the candle, if you can see it, there's some marble here on the altar. All altars should have some type of stone or marble because Christ is the... Thank you. He's the cornerstone. Back in the day, before it became legal to worship, in the time of Constantine, God bless his mother, St. Helena, we could not, could not worship freely. We would have to go into the catacombs. We would find a tomb of a saint, which would be a stone enclosure. We would put two candles. And then you and I would pray over that tomb. And our sacrifice would be made. There's the altar, the sacrifice. Therefore, there came the Eucharist. So therefore, almost every altar has to have some aspect of stone. The reason you need to know this is because he's the cornerstone. It's part of our tradition. It's part of scripture. 
My brother in Christ, if you were able to walk up here, you would see five crucifixes in the altar, each for the five wounds that he suffered. You would see relics of bones of the holy people that came before us, the saints. That's why if you and I lived back in the day, we would have been praying over a tomb. That's why we have communion of saints, a participation of the saints. They are at every mass. I told you that earlier. Everybody's from heaven is here. He's the God of the living, not of the dead. Everybody is part of the mass. Hence why we have relics in our altar. My brother in Christ, listen to what I'm telling you. If you don't have an altar, you don't have sacrifice. If you don't have a sacrifice, you don't have the Eucharist. Do this in, in sacrifice of me. That's his real words. He's saying you need to do this. Why would he tell you to do it if he just wanted you to have a thought? Why would he tell you to do it if he just wanted you to have an understanding? Why would he tell you to do it if he just wants you to be just something just to think about, to mull over, to kind of have a, an understanding? He's telling you you need to do this sacrifice. And then when you do it, it's no longer the, a lamb, it's the lamb. That's where he's going. See, in the Passover meal, we actually believe the lamb was present, skewered in the form of a crucifix, because that's what they're used to doing. That's why he told John and Peter, go there and prepare a Passover. They don't know about the bread. They haven't been exposed to it. That's why after they probably partook of the lamb, he said, now you need to do this and not so much this in sacrifice of me. My brother and sister in Christ, everything in the mass is scriptural. Nobody's making anything up. It's not 12 guys sitting around a table thinking, oh, throw this in. I tell you what. And St. Helena and Amy, make sure they use incense. Those people cough at anything. Okay, you with me? Okay, therein lies the point. My brother in Christ, when mass starts, Moses would come out of his tent in the desert. Music would start and everybody would stand. We enter the back, everybody stands, the music starts. Why? Because the glory cloud came down in the desert, which means God is about to come. Y'all stand and sing because he's about to come. The church is made in the shape of a crucifix. His feet are at the door. His head is at the tabernacle. His wound is at the altar. This is why I kiss the altar. Because that's where his wound is. Why is that important to you and I? Because when he's on the cross and he dies, we know he's dead. Because they would have broken his shins, if otherwise, to make him suffocate so he would die quicker. The fact that they don't do it means they stab him and he still bleeds. Which means he's divine. Which is why there's two candles. He's human and divine. Which means I'm going to continue to feed people 2,000 years later in St. Helena. Even though that I'm, quote, here with you today because you're eating my glorified body. You're not eating the cannibalistic mindset of the rabbis. You're eating my glorified body. If I came to you in my, in my physical flesh and I start hacking off limbs and pieces, would you partake? No. I got to give it to you under the auspices of bread. So that you will consume it. And matter of fact, in his words, Trogo, you need to tear it, gnaw on it, and swallow it. That sound like a relic to you? I need you to take this and eat. Chew on it, gnaw on it, and swallow it. Because I just want you to have a recollection. Listen to what I'm telling you. Everything in the New Testament has to be better than the old. If Joseph saved his family flee into Egypt... Joseph saved the Holy Family flee into Egypt. If Elijah wears camel skin and talks of the Messiah, John the Baptist wears camel skin and baptized the Messiah. If they got blessed bread from heaven, and they believe they did, it fell from the altar of God, then we must have something better than. Hence why it cannot be a relic or theory of conjecture. Why? Because we have an altar, which means we have the sacrifice, which we use the same words so that we can have the Eucharist. My brother and sister in Christ, we kiss the altar because we kiss the wound of Christ, which is where life begins for you and I. If you ever notice, I can put my hands on the altar, but a deacon is not supposed to because his hands are not consecrated. My brother says, Christ, we kiss the altar, and then guess what? We begin with the Gloria, which is what the angels told the shepherds that he's about to come, which is why you and I sing the Gloria, because he's about to come. Then we listen to what it was like before Christ got here, and then we sing the Psalms. The Psalms are the bridge that connects the old to the new. I mean, how do you and I know what, what readings go with what readings? I mean, there's Old Testament, New Testament. I mean, did you just throw it up in the air and hope they just fall together? 
The psalm that they sang in that time frame would have been the exact same psalm. The, the theory, and as a matter of fact, the understanding would have connected the two. That's why you and I sing the psalm, because we're Jewish. Because his mom's Jewish. His stepfather's Jewish. He's Jewish. He's even found in a synagogue. My brother and sister Christ, and then guess what? We hear the great I am speak himself. 2,000 years later, word for word, we hear the Messiah speak. And then guess what? We're now going to go back to the Last Supper. We're actually going to represent, recommunicate. And if you listen closely to me, you notice that I'm speaking in third person. He takes the bread. He breaks it. He blesses it. And then I say, this is, that's right. I'm telling you right then, what happened 2,000 years ago has now just took place. The Jews believe that when you do this, you call down God from heaven. 3,000 years ago. We're still doing it today. When those bells ring, that's what the priest would wear in the garment. So when he was before the tabernacle, you and I would know he's before God. So we ring them bells that let you know we are before God. And then all of a sudden, my brother in Christ, I speak in third person, and then I jump to first person. You even notice that I raise him, just like he was raised on the crucifix. That's how John understood. When he walked out there and saw that crucifix rise up, he said, oh my God. Oh my God. There must be a God. Because he raised it and said, this is my body. And now, that is his body too. John got it. My brother and sister in Christ, I walk and we do it again for the cup. And then guess what, my brother in Christ, we go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And how do you and I know he's there? Because every Jew's got to go there. So you and I have to go there. He warns his apostles of being worried. And next thing you know, he tells them it's anxiety. Be careful, the devil's on the prowl. And guess what? Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all. Exactly right. The devil gets you and I through worry, and he's warning his apostles of what's coming, and now he's warning you. And then guess what? We go to the garden. We actually go to Golgotha. You see me break the host because blood and water flew from his side and his body. I actually break it, put it in the chalice, so now that all of them have become one. We only put water in his chalice because blood and water only flew from his side, not from our sides, hence it doesn't go in other chalices. You see me, brother and sister in Christ, raise a fractured host, so you know we're at Golgotha yet again. He's not being re-crucified. He's being re-communicated. He's beginning to feed 5,000 more people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then guess what? We put him back together. He makes all things new, and we raise him like he did on the third day. And then the coup de gras, you and I are on the road to Emmaus. We come to participate in communion, kenoimia, in their language. Hence why St. Paul said, it's the cup of blessing, not the blood, the, the blood of Christ. It's not the bread we break, not the body of Christ. He's saying, that's what you're doing. You're re-participating. Otherwise, think about it. You came to feed 12 guys, and you left? What do you mean? Oh, well, they got blessed bread. We just got a relic. You're kidding me. You came for 12 guys. Well, that's just a fine how-do. I thought you came, you so loved the world that you sent your son for the sacrifice of many. That's why on the road to Emmaus, he's proven to you and I that even outside of the 12, I'm going to take the bread, I'm going to break it, bless it, and then I'm going to disappear in the bread. For I am the bread of life. I am the new lamb. That's why John the Baptist says, there goes the lamb of God. That's why I was born in the city of Bethlehem, the city of bread. That's why I was born in the manger, manger to eat. To prove to you that I am the bread of life. That I am in the bread. And if you see this and you have an altar and you have sacrifice, then you will have the Eucharist. If you go somewhere and that is not what's taking place, may I suggest you get up and leave. You're wasting your time and everybody else's. My brother and sister in Christ, when you bring those gifts up to the altar, do you realize that is 2,000 years old? Man, you're doing the same thing you did back in the time of Christ. Christ even had to do it. Can you imagine? He goes with his mom from the Sea of Galilee and Joseph. He's got to walk two to three months just to get there, at least two months that I know of. You go all the way to Jerusalem. You find a lamb. You're the lamb finding a lamb. You're going to go, and you're going to go to the woman's court on that proverbial Passover day. There's going to be a million people, one city block. You, Joseph, and Mary, 
Joseph's going to turn to Jesus and say, come. Mary will stay in the woman's court because she's prohibited from going any further. You're going to walk into the, past the doors in the arch, walk up some steps. You're going to get to a rail. That's why we have a rail. He's actually going to give the lamb to the high priest who's going to skewer him in the form of a crucifix. Three, four hundred, five hundred thousand lambs. He's going to bleed him right about here. He's going to take the blood and pour it out in the church. He's going to take the blood and pour it out in the church. And then he's going to give the lamb back to him. They've been seeing this for 32 years. You don't think the Blessed Mother knows what waits for her son? You don't think Joseph has caught on after 29 years what waits for his adopted son, if you will? So when you bring the gifts up, you're doing the exact same thing they did thousands of years ago. I take it, I break it, I bless it. The reason the rail is there is to delineate, quote, holy ground. You remember when Moses had to take off his sandals? That's exactly the point. You're on holy ground. It has nothing to do with me being a priest and you not. That's a lie. It's got everything to do with giving him his reverence and his due. That this indeed is holy ground. My brother and sister in Christ, when you see six candles up there, six to a Jew is incomplete. He's the seventh candle. He's seventh is the most complete number in the world to a Jew. He is the light of the world. Six is the six jars at the wedding of Cana. Remember at the wedding of Cana, six jars, 30 gallons each. 180 gallons of wine. 180 gallons of wine. Yeah, you're right. It's Catholic. Don't make a mistake, mistake about it. My brother and sister in Christ, he's saying to his mother, my hour is not yet come when I will bleed from my side. Then I will be the seventh jar. His la her last words, do whatever he tells you. Six is incomplete. Seven is complete. That's why you see six candles, for he is the seventh. The reason you see two candles over there is because, my brother in Christ, it's the old and the new. The reason you see seven steps up to the, the uh, tabernacle is because there's the seven sacraments. The reason you see PX up there is because that means CHR, body of Christ. Hence why I say body of Christ and not body of Jesus. Christ uh, is his divine name. Jesus is his given name. We're eating his glorified body. My brother Christ, everything in the mass is scriptural. That's why there's angels around his altar. You know the reason we have a cove? is because they used to cover the tabernacle back in the day. They used to call it like a baldacchino. Everything we do in the Mass is scriptural. This, this, um, I can't even think what it is now. <laughs> I ran myself right off the reservation. <laughs> Behind curtain number one. The tabernacle is a microcosm of the Jewish temple. If you were to take that and blow it up and make it a hundred times larger... It would actually be a temple. You would have a curtain on the front door. If I move the curtain, you'd see a door. And then if you open that door, you'll see, and you notice when I go later, there's a curtain behind the curtain. That's the second curtain. That's where Christ resided. That's where the Holy of Holies was kept. So the tabernacle is a microcosm of the Jewish temple. My brother and sister Christ, what I've got to get you to understand is the mass is everything. And the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life. If you are not in him, and, and we are not, excuse me, if we are not in him and he is not in us, we do not have eternal life. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. If I'm not in you and you are not in me, you do not have eternal life. What does that say if you go somewhere and you can't receive the Eucharist? That says volumes. Listen to what I'm telling you. I don't care where you go to service, but if you're not in the Catholic Church as a Catholic, you're not receiving the Eucharist. So your chances for eternal life become extremely mitigated. What I'm trying to get you to understand is you can't just kind of pick and choose which commandments. You can't pick and choose whether you're in. You're either in or you're out. You're either Catholic or you're not. You're either walking towards him or you're walking away from him. Especially with the Mass and the Eucharist. It is everything. He's telling you that if I'm not in you and you're not in me, you will not, not have eternal life. There's no asterisk, there's no supposition, there's no discretion, there's no discussion, uh, dis discussions, there's nothing. Do you understand? He said, I'll be with you to the end of time. He is. Do you know there's a mass every hour of every day in every country of every language? Listen, every hour of every day in every country of every language. Manna fell every day, it's got to fall every hour of every day in the world today. My brother and sister in Christ, eta misa esque. Go forth and proclaim the gospels. Go forth and proclaim the good news. The mass is everything. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Yee. 
Okay, and I'm going to tell you, just, okay, you, just be seated a minute. Why? Because I can catch my breath. That's why we're doing that. If you learned anything, then God bless you. Because we should have been telling you this since grammar school and since high school. We're losing our grandchildren and we're losing our children because we're not teaching you the faith. But I got to tell you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to owe for a lot of sins in my life. I know it. I can feel it. It's tangible. And he's right to do so. But my day will come. But I'm going to tell you one thing he's not going to tag me for. is not proclaiming the truth. Before I met you, I could never speak in public. I never spoke in public in my prior life. For 20 years, even as the owner of the business, I never spoke in public because I stutter and stammer. And the only time I don't do it is when I proclaim his news at the Mass. So you can't tell me, oh my God, there isn't a God. I need you to understand our faith. So say what you will about how I pray the Mass. But one thing you'll never accuse me of is not telling you the truth. Take what you want, discard the rest. At the end of the day, it's your soul. I'm just trying to help you. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand.